I'm Maya Pavinska Sims, the EMEA editor of Provoke, and I'm joined on the panel by three fantastic guests today who are just coming into the room, I believe. There's Paul. And Hello. Valerie and Kirsty. Hi, thanks for joining me, guys. First, we've got Valerie Tan, Vice President of PR, Social Media and Internal Communications at the Emirates Group. Hi, Valerie. Thanks for joining us this morning. Then we've got Kirsty O'Connor, Hill Hill Norton Strategies, Director of Content, Data and Digital for the Middle East, Turkey, India and Africa. And finally, we've got Paul Quigley, CEO of Newswhip, which monitors and predicts news, news engagement in real time. Thank you all for joining me today. Paul, you're going to kick things off, I think, with a short slide presentation uh, laying out the landscape here. So over to you for that. Brilliant. Um, thank you, Maya. I hope I'm sharing my screen now. Does it appear that I am? It does to me, yeah. Brilliant. Um, so um, what I um, want to talk today really is about the partnership between um, in, in getting through the new media ecosystem with all of the threats that it presents, the partnership between data and the decision maker. And uh, what I'll just need to do is take control of these slides. And um, where can the data help? Um, and where can the data, um, wh what are the limits of the data and where it can help? And really to open, I like to talk about how, uh, and maybe bring everyone's attention to how much the world has changed in the last 10 years. If you were running this orange juice company back in 2010, your main concerns would have been producing marketing and distributing orange juice. If you're running the same business in 2021, there's a whole range of new social, political, and economic uh, issues that have come onto the table. The provenance of your juice, um, conditions of your workers, the sources of your raw materials, packaging, and even, of course, that plastic straw that, that it comes with. So the world really has changed a lot and consumers have changed a lot over the last decade. And that presents a lot of new reputation issues for brands. These reputation issues can stem from misinformation um, spreading in groups such as um, vaccine misinformation or misinformation about 5G. And it can also just stem from different actions that a brand takes, landing it in the crosshairs of, of motivated groups. And of course, um, with social media and with everyone having a camera phone linked to social media at all times, the smallest misstep by an employee anywhere can also uh, land a company um, in reputation risk very quickly. So this is our new media ecosystem. And two of the, the characteristics uh, of it are the formation of new groups, um, often protest groups, um, which can, uh, you know, I think really uh, the social media era in a sense perhaps began in, in the Arab Spring in 2011. And there's a picture there of Terrier Square. And, uh, but we see the uh, similar social and digital dynamics leading to all kinds of different groups being organized and turning into um, uh, real world movements. And then of course, there's new narratives and new uh, sets of ideas that spread as well. And uh, we see these very much, um, it's, it's very difficult for any brands to keep their reputation completely um, separate from this uh, very active and political world. And I have a kind of, hopefully slightly amusing um, example of this from the Middle East to share this morning. Um, and this uh, is a picture of three uh, minor celebrities known as influencers. And your audience uh, may know that the influencers descended upon Dubai back in January of this year. Um, the context here is Dubai was uh, doing very well run um, checks, um, PCR checks for uh, coronavirus and uh, was more open than other places in the sun. And as a result, uh, many UK-based social media influencers um, flocked to Dubai. And uh, over the last couple of days, I was having a look on our platform to see um, how engagement was on the stories about that, because it generated quite a bit of controversy back in the UK. Um, and in the graph on the left, you can see a few spiky mountains. And that's 
the level, uh, the top graph is the level of public engagement on stories and mentions of the influencers. And the bottom graph is media interest in stories about the influencers being in Dubai. So what happened was there was an initial spike of interest around January 14th, as you can see, um, in the story of, of UK influencers being there and a degree of, um, I suppose, annoyance on the part of public and, and, and journalists and perhaps media fanning those flames a bit. However, there was a real substantial spike then later in January as some influencers defended their travel as work. And uh, I think this seemed to strike a chord with uh, a great many people in the UK and the idea that this was a hard graft of being in the sun was quite unacceptable to a lot of the public and we saw a real spike in outrage. What was very interesting and unusual about this narrative is it united in the UK the ununitable groups of the right and the left. There's been quite a split in UK politics post Brexit but you can see the headline on the left is from The Independent, um, which is a more left-wing publication. The headline on the right is from The Daily Mail. And the Guardian columnist who have screenshotted in the center there noted that the Instagram influencers in Dubai had achieved the impossible of uniting um, the nation in the UK. And um, unfortunately, how this resulted is kind of to some degree a political response, which resulted in this last spike and uh, the uh, Priti Patel, the um, Home Secretary in the UK, putting Dubai on the red list um, of travel destinations. And I don't think there was, this was a very unpredictable and unusual narrative to have emerged. Um, the, the, the influencers coming to Dubai may have been kind of an unintended consequence of um, what were freer travel rules in Dubai but it certainly had some very strange narrative that formed in the UK and that had kind of negative reputation or a negative outcome there at the end. It's unclear if there's any negative longer term reputation, but certainly this narrative was, was uh, something that was uh, grabbed onto by politicians in the UK and uh, resulted in um, this, this, this action. So, where can the data help? Like you can see on the left, certainly data can help you see the scale of different issues that are taking place in the in the public media ecosystem. Um, and some of the most important things you can do with that data um, as a communicator, I think, are to look at the most shared authors, um, the top tweets, what people are saying on Instagram, and you can really get a handle on the narrative that's 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 uh, shaping up around any issue in the public sphere. Um, you can also, uh, of course, set up alerts so that if something is reaching a certain scale, you can see if it's worthy of a response or not. And I, I think an important thing that the data can do is in, can unearth nuances. Um, the, 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 there may be a lot of media being published, but which precise stories are the, uh, are the public actually engaging with? And what percentage are those stories of the overall engagement with the story? And it might be that something that's contra-narrative um, or that's, a, that's got an interesting twist and it might be the bit of a story that the public is engaging with um, the most. And ultimately, this is about informing better decisions. And this is where we come to the handshake between data and the communications professionals. Um, this is all data about what's happening in the outside world, but what happens in terms of decision making is very high context uh, work on the part of the professional. Um, I like this quote from Andrew Bowens, he's a long term user of ours at, at, at the ESA and at KPMG and describes, I think a lot of the time his use of this data is to help bring people's attention to the right issue and to inform the decision and also to sell the decision. If you've got a recommendation and there's a lot of data to back it up um, in the modern C-suite, that makes the decision a lot more of a, of a no-brainer. So pretty summarizing the role of the data here is, is always limited. We can quantify, identify, it can alert, it can validate a view, but ultimately um, the decision maker is then interpreting that, contextualizing it, and deciding strategy. And what we're hoping to do with the data and the left column is to extend the capabilities um, in the right column um, so that we can navigate this very volcanic new media ecosystem um, as best we can. 
Um, so that's my kind of introduction and um, looking forward to getting the panel's views on you know, whether and how um, data can play a role in navigating this, uh, this complex new ecosystem in which we find ourselves. Thanks, Paul. That's really interesting. All that stuff throws up some some really um, uh, big questions. The the main one it, uh, of which is your point of the handshake, I think, between data and human beings. Um, Pan, if I can come to Kirsty and, and Valerie. And Kirsty, I'll ask you this first. What, what what is that point of the handshake between the data and the human? What's what what can data and tools help you with? How far can they go? And at what point and what is required after that to make those decisions in, in quite sensitive, fast moving environments? I'd actually say it's more of a, an embrace than a handshake. Um, and the reason being for that is you almost have to take your left arm um, and that is kind of putting the, the data into these kind of tools. So a tool is only as good as what you input. Then obviously it can do kind of the AI and machine learning, but then at the end, there's also an output. So with your right hand, you have to take that data and, and make sense of it. Um, and, and as Paul rightly said, there's a role of a decision maker there, but also as comp professionals, um, we need to work with kind of data analytics teams and also behavioral science teams to kind of understand what is happening and how then that evolves our crisis communication strategy or our reputation strategy. Um, and for me, that's something that's really important and sometimes we don't see enough of is that there can be a misunderstanding or a misinterpretation of the data. Um, so it's making sure that we have kind of people in, in place that are embracing those tools and those data sources um, to make sense of it um, and make sure that that then shapes um, our output um, into, into the media, into social media um, and direct consumers as well. And Valerie, what's your experience been of, of, the, of the value and limits of, of data and tools and then what has to happen after that at Emirates? Well, I want to just say I agree so much with Kirsty that you know, data is also about what goes into the tool. And that's the very first question I ask any data provider. And we do work with a number of them through our PR agency network, as well as directly, because it's rubbish in, it's rubbish out. And sometimes tools, uh, people, when they see dashboards and they see graphs, you know, they get carried away and they start to jump to conclusions. And without questioning, you know, actually what was the universe from which that data was extracted from? And that makes a huge difference on how decisions are being made. But in general, once you're set and agreed, you know, this is the universe, of data that's being looked at, you have to come to a point when you are comfortable and accepting that you can then make your decisions, you can trust the data, and then what are the, what are the criteria. So once you get to that point, I have to say data is important, but it's not the be all and end all. When companies make their decisions, they really need to have a very clear idea. At Emirates, it's the same thing. We have, very, we, have, we have so many things and we are global operations. We monitor everything and there are systems in place that we have that will alert us when things come to a critical mention point. So if it's like one person with five followers tweeting, probably that's not really going to get much attention from us because we've got so much conversations happening with our brand. But if it hits a certain threshold, it does get flagged to us and then we make the judgment call. Does this require us to address it? Is it something that is an immediate issue that we address or is this part of our longer term reputation strategy? And data can help, but it's not the decision, only decision driver. It helps us to choose our battles, let's put it that way, because you can't fight everything, you can't respond to everything, you don't have to respond to everything. And once we've agreed or understood what's important to respond to, we also have to make a decision call on which battleground are we going to engage on. Sometimes you see an issue um, addressed to us or tagged to us, and we need not necessarily respond to it on that same channel. So somebody's tweeting at us aggressively over and over again on a, a topic, maybe we will address it, but not through that same channel because it's not the appropriate channel for privacy reasons or for something else. So customers uh, is a classic one, right? So they have an issue with a bag or some, some experience that they didn't really like. They tweet us, we look at it, but we'll ask them to direct message us or we have their contacts and we'll go through another channel. We don't have to make everything we don't have to fight that same battle on that same channel. So I think data is important, but uh, that the, the dynamic between, you know, how do you interpret the data, how do you use it, and how do you base a decision, decision uh, it requires a human touch. I'll give another example, if, if, if you don't mind. We yeah. had a, a recent... Uh, 
uh, incident, like this early this year, one of our long time uh, sports sponsorship partners, Collingwood uh, Football Club, that's uh, Australian Rules um, Football Club. So they, they published a, in, an independent report uh, around racism, which they, had com which they had commissioned, was published and that created a whole you know, storm and controversy uh, about the club's history of racism. I mean, it was it's an emotive issue. And of course, as major sponsors for the last two decades, we were dragged or people tried to drag us into that conversation. Now, knowing that as a brand, we stand for you know a global international uh, company that connects people, cultures, communities. We know that this is something that we have a position on. Clearly, discrimination of any form is abhorred and we could make a stand but we had to be very careful so we looked at what it was and we said look this issue is i'm not racism is a global thing but i mean this particular issue was contained within australia so did we really have to address it outside of australia no so then our strategy and our response was very much uh, guided by that insight okay that's absolutely fascinating example kirsty coming back to you how do you decide whether you know and the noise is becoming a movement that you need to respond that you don't need to respond which battleground you fight it on have you got any examples of, of where you've handled that for clients at h and k yeah i think valerie's absolutely right and i just to throw into there as well and um, purpose is obviously really important to brands and we've talked about that already today so we you wouldn't necessarily respond as, as emirates say unless it really matched kind of your purpose and you, you know you're not going to be cheeky like some of the brands we see now on um with their community management on social media so um that also is something that comes into play with that but answering in your question um there is so much noise in the internet um and you do have to kind of zone in zone out choose your battles where to where to to um to place um your battle as well and for us, that is all based on kind of our, our tool stack and our people. So we have a, a number of, of tools, um, and, and as Valerie rightly said, they can then merge into, into dashboards um, to help us kind of look and listen um, and then decide when to react. And I think that's something that's really changed over the last 10 years or so, where you know, you'd have your crisis and your reputation plan in place and you'd wait 24 hours for the news cycle to hit. Um, we no longer have that time. Um, everything is, is is quite reactive, and what you can see is is brands and and you know and, and governments to a degree jump too quickly because they panic that um, they see a tweet with you know someone with five followers um, or someone with a blue tick, um, even though they may only have ten thousand followers. And it's not all based on followers, but it's noting that that tweet and and monitoring it. And it's kind of deciding whether that is the point of action that we want to respond. Um, and, and kind of one of the examples that I always use um, and, and that was heavily talked about in this region about three, four years ago was obviously the, the Qatar blockade. Um, and with that, through many questions, not only from consumers, um, but from many of our clients and also from, from colleagues um, in our agency, which was what happens now? Um, and that kind of battlefield, as we put it, was very much um, social media um, and online news. So every day at H&K, we were monitoring that continuously and pulling twice daily reports. Um, in some cases, we do more than that um, to specific clients because some days um, you'd wake up and it was, um, you know, a lot of Twitter conversation in Saudi Arabia around the, the food and drink industry. So any of our clients that were um, represented there, we'd have to alert them to kind of what was happening what hashtags are trend, trending and also there's different languages at play so obviously there was a certain instance where we had a kind of a Turkish client and it was kind of being played out in Saudi Arabia so we had two different languages to deal with um, and then the client who also spoke in English so you then throw all that together and you can also be kind of consumed by data um, and that is why we always go back to that human input which is you can get so swamped by it all that you do need to make sense of it and, and tools do help with that um but they are obviously ai and, and, and human they learn from humans so at hk we have all these tools in place we monitor we have alerts like um, uh, valerie said and we make sure that we kind of hone in on certain areas with our client kind of in mind and that's exactly what we did with qatar and um, which was mainly kind of social media listening if i'm honest um, because that was far quicker than the, the news reaction um, that was played out in the region. So um, not to discuss kind of like individual clients, but that is a prime example of where 
there was lots of platforms, lots of brands, lots of consumers, lots of languages, all play, played out at the same time. And it's making sure that um, we as, as um, comms professionals with our data analytics teams are not being consumed by it as such and making sure we're finding the insights and putting them into action. Kirsty, can you give us a sense, you know, being totally honest with your experience at, at H&K, just how complex in the in the region is this kind of whole new landscape of groups and narratives and geopolitical nuance and societal factors that are emerging? What, what's it like being at the heart of it at the moment? I, I, I thoroughly enjoy my role. I think um, every day is very different. Uh, we have a fascinating region made up of, um, you know, very different brands, organizations, governments, and also consumers and languages and diversity. Um, but, but what that brings with it is that every day is, is different. And, you know, you wake up one morning and suddenly Clubhouse is, is the next thing. But obviously that platform has challenges because there is no current measurement within it. And there is no moderation within it. It's all moderated by the user. So you can wake up and that's a thing. And then suddenly the next day you wake up and um, there's kind of something happening on Twitter in Saudi Arabia. Um, and each country has a preferred platform. Um, it's a very young region. So a lot of things are played out on social media, but each, um, each country has its preferred platform. So we almost have to be looking um, everywhere at all times. Um, but we do tend to do that um, at a country level and that's why um, the beauty of H&K is we are a, a regional network so we have people on ground seeing what's happening in that country seeing what's happening in those brands and then connecting it back together at a, a regional level which is what we do in our innovation creative hub so we have a full sense of what's happening across the region but it is very difficult and you can get you know consumed by you know there's still obviously media which is you know tv radio print you've then got streaming, you've then got podcasts, you've then got all the social media channels that go with it. So you could be sat 24 hours a day looking at data and, and reading the tweets that are coming in for all different kinds of brands. So it's making sure that you're not kind of, again, as I say, consumed by it and it's being organized by the tools and the tool set that you have and putting that in front of clients, which is digestible and very clear with actions that lead into, into insights. Um, thanks, Kirsty. Valerie, did you have anything to add there or do you want to skip straight to the Dubai influencers example and what, what actually happened there from a reputational point of view for Dubai? Uh, well, before we, we jump into, into Dubai and, and the whole influencer and travel shaming issue, I, I want to say reputation, when you look at reputation, when we look at reputation management as a, as a practice, you know, sometimes you, we have to understand that issues are not about facts, right? They, they can be very, very emotive and you don't just win with facts alone. And that's where sometimes when you look at data, it's just emo, like, you know, you, you see volumes, you see, you see volumes, you see trends, but it's going, it, the nuances, and I know the tools are improving on a on a yearly basis it gets better but it does require still contextualization so there's data and then you have to put that data into bigger context of the broader so if you're looking at a specific issue on social media you need to look at that issue in the broader context of what else is happening in social media but then outside of social media as well because social media tends to amplify certain things okay and that it gives you a very different and warped reality so twitter could be the dominant um, platform in this region for political discussions but maybe Maybe that's only a certain, it only hits a certain segment of people who have access to it. So it's like you just have to understand the context. So I want to say, you know, if you ask me about reputation management and particularly looking at it in the context of data, uh, you can't do without the human touch because emotions, I don't think tools are that great at tackling that aspect just yet. Neat. It's a year in, I still can't get used to it. Um, what about the influences, Valerie? What happened? Oh, Lordy, should we not let Paul tell us because he he, <laughs> he picked up that data. What well, tell happened, us, Paul? Tell us what happened. <laughs> what went wrong there? Well, I mean, one of the things we've, we've seen, I think looking at it, content engagement around everything related to coronavirus over the last year are the celebration of pro-social things, stories of sacrifice, stories of things coming together. Um, but you may remember Italians singing on balconies almost a year ago now. 
and a lot of brands taking pro-social stands, uh, producing hand sanitizer, a lot of those stories actually did really well on social. I think there may have been, to some degree, among communications professionals, some eye-rolling eventually, like uh, at, at some of the, um, how, how many different brands were coming in and, and, and taking steps. But in fact, the, the public seemed to really love, love that. And the flip side of that is the condemnation and, uh, you know, real, uh, reservation of a lot of hatred for people who were breaking rules or who were perceived as not pulling their weight and i mean i think here you had dubai as a real um kind of casualty a kind of a bystander casualty and what was essentially a uk phenomenon um, i don't think the influencers all have a whatsapp group and decided to organize and head on down but certainly when the pictures started flowing back probably via the daily mail the daily mail did great on both sides of this um, and, and via Instagram, people in the UK started getting annoyed and, as the Guardian columnist pointed out, did seem to unite the country. And, you know, some, some social media things really are storms in a teacup. And I think Kirsty and Valerie were right to be pointing that out. You need to quantify things. Twitter in a lot of countries is a small minority of people and the act of tweeting users is an even smaller group. Um, but that said, you know, sometimes when you, when you do quantify things and look at what the data is, you can see a real groundswell building and, and, and that's what happened there. Yeah, but I also want to say travel shaming and, and this flight, it wasn't just the Dubai thing. I think if you look at Canada, there were also instances of politicians being called out for having traveled when everybody else was forced not to meet with their loved ones. And I think this is the classic case of you know, an emotive topic, you know, that um, it was what this it was really about individual behavior right individual responsibility there's a fair bit of sunshine jealousy over there um but then dubai got dragged into it uh, uh, as a as a as a side effect and even though uh, and that's really unfortunate when when in reality dubai actually has a really good pandemic containment strategy and a very clear um method and response of you know constantly uh, adjusting the measures the pandemic measures and that's a clear priority to keep the city open while having a balanced approach to health, economic and community, you know, um, priorities. I mean, uh, Kirsty, uh, Maya and Kirsty were discussing earlier about how sometimes politicians under pressure of social media scrutiny, they just make knee-jerk comments and knee-jerk reactions. I think Dubai, in contrast, has a very measured uh, and clear strategy and approach. So it was very unfortunate. And I think after the initial frenzy died off, uh, and you can see from Paul's lovely charts that it was a little bit of a storm in the teacup times two, one small spike, one big spike. And then after that, the you know Dubai tourism uh, stakeholders, including the DTCM, came up and they started to tell outside the story with the facts. I mean, Emirates is kind of like a tangential, I think, stakeholder to this because clearly, you know, Dubai destination, we have a big stake in that. So we were watching the issue really closely. It was fascinating. But I would say a bit of a storm in the teacup and we were, Dubai was the... Uh, side effect. Yeah. Kirsty, what could have Dubai have done differently there? Yeah, so this goes back to my point about almost too much information. So um, everyone who works with me knows how fascinated I was by this um, UK influencers, obviously, because I'm British, but I wanted to see kind of what was really happening and were they really here on business, as they called it. Um, and I refuse to call them influencers. They are reality stars and um, with a fake following. So we looked into um, uh, one of our one of our tools and we can see that their following is made up of bots so you see a large number of followers from Vietnam, Bangladesh, sometimes India which are where you see bot farms and what that means is they're not real people they are bots they don't engage with their content and um, we also did scrapes of some of their content you could see there was no tagging there was no ads there was no sponsored content those influencers came here of their own accord they were not brought here by you know, hotel chains by the Dubai government. They were here on holiday and they used the business travel rule of the UK to say that they were here on business, but they were not brought here by anyone in Dubai. And um, they definitely weren't brought here by HK. So um, we were kind of inquisitive to find out these, this information using our tools. Um, not related to any of our clients, it's just something that we do now and again when we see, we see topics of interest. Um, and it was sad to see that Dubai's reputation was affected because we could see that again with, you know, um, with Newswhip. Um, but also we looked at the individuals that were kind of responsible for that. So potentially if you were a media outlet in the UK, maybe you would have looked into those ports of data, perhaps. And it would have been a very different story, which would have been defensive to, to Dubai and, and to Canada, as Valerie mentioned. 
Um, but I don't think people were looking um, in the right area and at the right data to see actually where the real story was with those reality stars who were having a nice holiday here, paid for all come... by themselves. <laughs> yeah, I was just jealous. It all comes back to the data, doesn't it? Guys, uh, too quickly, our time together has come to an end this morning. Um, thank you so much, Paul, for that overview of what's going on. And um you know, really frank discussion about the, the absolute need for and limits of data and the embrace, as Kirsty and Valerie said, of, of human beings required to make those big decisions about how to handle reputational threats in, in, in extraordinary times, as we all know. So thank you all very much for joining me this morning.